Welcome to the first ever installment of the Design Dialogues hosted by the D School Africa. Um, my name is Nyla Conway and I will be moderating the session. So just a little bit about me is that I am currently a program lead here at D School Africa um, and I also teach a design thinking module at the School of International Training Graduate Institute in the USA that does a module in Cape Town. And previously, I was a program convener for the Info and Health Innovation at UCT, where design thinking was taught as the problem solving methodology. So it's really great to see everyone. We have a full house, and it's really uh, encouraging to see. Um, but what has brought us all here on a Tuesday evening? Um, and hopefully, that's our interest in and the practice of design thinking. Just in case, um, what but what is design thinking just let's just recap that it's an iterative approach to problem solving that foregrounds the needs of people first and leave, leverages diverse methods but leans heavily on the practices from the world of design and other qualitative methods design thinking is an approach and mindset to creative problem solving that is gaining traction especially in addressing complex societal issues. The work of the D School is a local example of this practice. Through a range of diverse programs over the past eight years, the D School's work has been highly regarded, earning praise from many program participants and partners alike. So to tell you more about the D School and its history. I'd like to invite Richard Perez, our founding director. Just come stand up here in the corner. Um, good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to be here and wonderful to be able to host you. Um, this is the beginning of hopefully many uh, events which we call in the Design Dialogues and we're very excited to, to see this one happen and it really is an opportunity for us to start to bring the community together and have debate and discussion. Um, a little bit of history of, of us and those that haven't been here before, this, um, this building is funded by the Hassett Platinum Foundation, um, six star green rated building, lots of things moving and doing their own things as you can hear. but. Um, it's really a beacon of innovation for teaching and learning um, in design and thinking and creativity. Um, we started in 2016 uh, at the Graduate School of Business um, and we were sort of incubated there. Um, but we're very fortunate enough to be part of a, sort of a wider network of, of D schools that are, have been funded by the Platinum Foundation. Um, there's the D School at Stanford University, uh, it started about 2004 and the one in Potsdam about 2007. Um, and we're very fortunate enough to be sort of a cousin in that family and, and from the foundation's perspective they really wanted to understand what is design thinking in our context, emerging markets um, on this continent with the diversity we have, the complexity that we have. Um, so although we're based and hosted at the University of Cape Town our mandate is much wider, it's very much around the African continent and started to build a community of practice around design thinking um, for, the, for the continent and start to work with other universities and start to learn from them. We certainly don't feel that we have all the answers. We, we want to be able to co-create, understand um, different perspectives and, and hopefully this evening um, you'll, be, you'll get a bit of a taste of that. Um, as far as us as a D-School here, we, we sort of had three key focuses. One is teaching and learning. This building is predominantly for teaching and learning. And these studios are really our, our lecture theatres, for want of a better word. Um, and we, we do work right away from at school level, university, undergrad and postgrad, and also into the executive education space. So for us, it's about working throughout the entire spectrum. In, our, in the ideal world, we shouldn't have to exist because this should, you know, this should be just the way we are taught at school and something we carry right the way through. Um, but with the the strategy is, well, let's start in at least higher education and then work down and up, and then hopefully over time we can work our way out of a job, um, which will be the ultimate vision. But we'll see. Um, I mean, Stanford is still around 20 years later, so still lots of work to be done, I would imagine. Um, 
The other focus is, is uh, the Learning and Discovery Lab, which is very much about building new knowledge, um, the research side of the Dean School, and really what this program this program sits within that that part of the, of, um, of the Dean School. So it's about new conversation, discussion, sharing, research, exploring, and then bringing that into our, our teaching and learning. And then the third. Um, focuses around facilitation and support, which is where we go out and sort of practice and work with organizations to assist them to go through an innovation process, give them an experience um, on how to use creativity in, the, in, the, in, in their own work environments. And that really concludes the, the ecosystems, the teaching and learning, the research and then the practice. And, and for us, it's very important that we mix that all together um, and don't get stuck in, in one of the silos, because um, for us, we're trying to sort of in some ways reinvent what academia should be. So I won't take any more of your time, but please enjoy the evening. And afterwards, network this evening is about finding other people, discovering, having discussions and debates. So uh, yeah, looking forward to it and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Richard. Um, so now I have a little bit about the different pillars that the D School has, and one of those pillars is the research agenda. So tonight's event is hosted by the Learning Lab, and that's managed by Associate Professor uh, Janice McMillan. And, she, and we are spearheading the research agenda of the D School. Um, its focus it will be the D School and the practice of design thinking, collaboration with UCT and across higher education and with societal partners in order to keep our work relevant to the real world. However, there has been increasing calls um, to consider our work a little bit more critically, to reframe it and to reimagine it. As much of the criticism stems from the fact that many of the techniques um, and models used in design thinking are might, they come from the global north and it might not fully resonate with the challenges we face in the global south which is what we've all experienced as we've practiced over the past few years so this has prompted us to open up the practice and hopefully enabling us to rethink and adapt our approaches so the design dialogues is one way to respond to these calls for a critical examination of the work so the d-school is planning four dialogues for 2024 and this is going to be offer a space for engagement and reflection with a wide range of stakeholders such as yourself so this first section is titled reframing design thinking in complex times so we also want to just acknowledge that the notion of complex times is very subjective um, and everything can seem complex all the time our current understanding complex times is just from the perspective of problem solving in a South African context and that is basically if we think about our given history our political and economic climate and landscape um, and then we also have an added layer of a really uncertain technological future which is fast changing so given all of those things you know we practice design thinking a very different world to say uh, Stanford 20 years ago. <coughs> so that is why we have gathered some of the leading design thinkers from the USA, from Kenya and from South Africa offering diverse perspectives and insights which is our panel that we have today. So I would like to introduce George Kimball who George is an entrepreneur, an educator, and investor, and he co-founded and led the Stanford D School for 14 years. And that's where they ushered in a wider global design thinking movement. He now works with leaders and investors around the world to unlock diverse human capacities, increasing adaptability and resilience, and accelerate breakthroughs and foster create creative flourishing at scale. I underline that. I'm going to ask you about that later. We also have um, Professor Mugendi Mutwareva. 
<laughs> a senator and past president of the World Design Organization and presently works at Machu Kos University in Kenya. He is passionate about various expressions of socially responsible design. Welcome. From our local environment, we have Marissa Moloto. She is the program lead at Hansa Platinum School Africa, and she founded the Lafika Foundation, a social enterprise in 2018. Marissa is deeply immersed in creating lasting change, focusing on mindset shifts and leaving education as a transformative tool for impactful best practice. Last but not least, we have Tiafo Monare. He is also a program lead and coach of D School Africa and leverages his background in architecture and design with extensive experience in design thinking workshops across sectors and international conferences. Tiafo is passionate about youth culture and enjoys the diverse perspectives that D School Africa students bring. Let's give them all a hand. So again, just thank you all for being here and coming all this way. Um, so we have we've, we've um, have this panel here with us today, and we'd like to draw from your vast experience in order to think more deeply or differently about the way design thinking is practiced, and hopefully how we can open it up. So just for the for the floor, we're going to have about four questions that we'd like to get through um, and we'll open up the floor to questions after the second question so we really invite some questions and comments from the from the floor so to kick us off um, i would like to know how each of you came into the field of of design thinking um, the field your field in practice of design thinking and let's start with george how we came into the field and practice of design thinking. Hello everyone, it's good to be here. Um, and we're, we're gonna try to keep it brief so we can, um, well at one level, one intersection point for me was around 2001 when I was an entrepreneur and I was in a venture capital firm after a few startups. And it wasn't, it didn't grab my heart being there, but it was a good time to rest as a young CEO. And I, I went back to Stanford, which I'm an alum of, uh, the, of the product design program that's been around for 40 years. I went back to a design talk and I remember feeling that that product design program had only about 15 students in it. It, it was invisible, but it had great impact. And uh, I went back to that talk and I could feel that design wanted to be something bigger at Stanford. And then I crossed paths with David Kelly, who was a professor of mine long before. And then he and I started talking, and that led to what is now known as the Stanford D School. And it was very unexpected for me. I thought I would never work in a university as an entrepreneur. And um, but for me, it was like my third startup. It was like being a CEO of a startup, but inside a university instead of in, in Silicon Valley. And it changed everything about what I understood about creativity, what I thought about leadership, when I thought about education, I have three boys, they're now like 15, 17, 19, totally changed my view of how they learn. It's changed my view about how I learn and what it means for me to move in my most natural way. It's where I found, I would say, my authentic, my unique leadership philosophy. It gave me a chance to practice that and the D-School flourished. And, and I maybe to, one last thing, so a lot of us point to that as an orange, origins of design thinking. In a way, it was a very important moment to crystallize some of the language and invite other people into a creative way of moving if they didn't think of themselves as creative. But the origins of these things root back decades before that. So when I was a college student at Stanford, I didn't know what to declare. My parents didn't go to college. And then I discovered mechanical engineering, which is about making things, and product design, which is about being creative. And that helped me feel something that I felt when I was really, really little, 
when I was playing with Legos for the first time, and I had this aha moment that we get to participate in creating what we have in our world. And I didn't know what to do with that until I was a student and discovered design, which then led me to designing businesses, which then led me back to Stanford, which led me to designing the D School, which is about how you design everything. And so I would say it was an unexpected intersection. Now I work globally, um, but that's how I ran into it, at about nine, playing with Legos. <laughs> That sounds like a good place to start. Are you still playing with Legos? <laughs> okay, so thank you, George. I've noted a few things down. Can we move on to Mugendi, please? How did you get to the field and practice of design thinking? Uh, thanks, Aylan. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I almost thought either my voice or the mic wasn't working. Yeah, it's really good to be back. Um, I consider this uh, my second home. Um, so this is really exciting. And meeting old friends again uh, is, is really a treat. Uh, I think my journey in, in um, discovering design thinking uh, began earlier than I thought, uh, as uh, uh, maybe a child growing up in different places, uh, co-creating um, games and toys eventually getting into industrial design as a practice. Uh, but it's only when I came to South Africa. Um, I'm from Kenya, just in case you're wondering. And no, I do not run. Um, <laughs> so uh, coming into South Africa and uh, uh, the work we did, particularly at CPUT, which is not far from here, and uh, the desire to communicate design to local communities, uh, it drove me towards uh, IDEO's uh, Human Center Design Toolkit. And so through this uh, idea of co-design um, and uh, participatory design, we started asking ourselves, so if uh, this is a tool that works across uh, different contexts, um, how do we make it uniquely uh, responsive to the African context? Um, so these conversations about Africa with a K run in parallel. Uh, with the ones around the human-centered design and design thinking um, in, our, in, our, in our local um, uh, dealings. Um, so eventually, uh, around uh, 2008, uh, is when I really started engaging seriously with this notion. Fast forward to 2010, uh, when the World Cup was in this uh, city and the country, uh, that I had a chance then to work with local communities in design thinking. And then in 2014, uh, when Cape Town uh, was designated World Design Capital, uh, and Richard was the, the director for the World Design Capital then, we were able to move this to the level of an entire city. Um, so this has been a journey from one or two small groups uh, to institutions, actually to, the, uh, to an entire city. Um, and I've seen it work, and so, uh, my current uh, thinking is really around uh, contextualizing design thinking across the continent, uh, working with local communities, uh, basket weavers and carvers and people who don't know the jargon of design thinking. Uh, we've just translated a uh, human-centered design toolkit into Kiswahili, uh, which is the language of the region. About 300 million people speak Kiswahili in Africa. Now it's one of the official languages of the Africa Union. And uh, we're in the phase now of testing. So hopefully you, you'll hear more about that eventually. And um, my lifelong quest has been to pursue the ideals of the Ubuntu ethos. Um, and so the notion of participation and inclusiveness um, has been something that I passionately pursue in my waking hours, sometimes even pursues me into my sleep. Um, and so the I coined something a, a while back, uh, which because you all know Ubuntu is I am because we are. Uh, and I coined something that helps me process this as I participate, therefore I am. And so my design thinking uh, practice is about participation and involvement. Thank you. Thank you so much for Gandhi. Um, I think Marissa's uh, ready. <laughs> Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm just so happy to be here. Um, 
And I'm excited to share my journey because it didn't start quite as young as nine with building Legos. I did play with Legos though um, as an allied health professional. Um, I was working with speech, language, and literacy um, pathology, so working in government health and government education. Um, and so I got to play all the time and used play as um, intervention or remediation. Um, but I definitely felt like a square peg in a round hole and um, kind of got told as one does go through medical school that you, we don't do that here. Um, just stick to, stick to the code, you know, lives depend on it. And I think that's when I really started to explore what, what is my authentic, authentic kind of um, yeah, skill set bring into a space and then moved um, out of kind of public health, public education into um, community-based organizations and that's where I really got to explore and kind of discover where my strengths lie through playing again, through participatory kind of action research um, and co-creation and then really start to, to find where can I find more of this information and kind of went down rabbit holes late at night, early in the morning. <laughs> um, and yeah, I found a MOOC about how to become a change maker with Bertha and R Labs and they really saw how they were using design-led mindsets. Um, then signed up to do something in kind of a postgraduate, like where can I just learn how to do it and participate with people. Um, ended up at Gibbs Social Entrepreneurship Program and that's where like after the first module I resigned and I'm like, I'm a social entrepreneur. Um, to the shock and dismay of everyone around me because this was probably like the third jump that I had made. Um, and then really started the journey of like kind of trying to dig deeper and, and embed myself and immerse myself in the world of social entrepreneurship, co-creation, co-design, um, and then sign up for a master's in um, inclusive innovation, um, info at um, GSB. And that's where we had our three day uh, dash, uh, which was, we got to play with Legos, but there were fights, there were tears, and as somebody that facilitates learning, I was like, what is this? I need this method in my toolbox. And yeah, that's where I decided to pursue kind of uh, another method to put in my toolbox and then yeah, apply to be a coach at D school. And so here I am. But I definitely use the approach in kind of all my spheres, um, whether working with government or education or civil society organizations, and use it as a, um, a methodology, but also um, as an intermediary play between stakeholders. So that's it. Thank you, Marissa. I learned a little bit more, even though I've heard that story a few times. Um, Diego? Cool. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hope you're all doing well, and thanks for having us here today. So, my name is Diego Monareng, and my background is architecture. So, the way that I got into architecture, I liked The Sims growing up. And then that was one of the easiest tools to actually engage with a lot of design practices, making houses, making homes, and making spaces for little sims to run around. So that was my entry point. But once in architecture school, uh, the one form of architecture that I really admired was just trying to see what African architecture can turn into and what that looks like within our context, also broadly within the developing world. So architecture usually gets to be a very big, expensive project that people get to do, and then you design something fancy, and people get to move into it. But whenever that happens like that, we sometimes leave behind the experiences of everyone else who might not be able to afford that design exercise. So one architect who stood out to me was um, Leanne Mbaswa, who founded Design Space Africa, which is now Design Network. And what I liked about him and his practice was that his ethos was designed for social change. How they practice this design for social change was to try to weave in African narratives within the design process, but also African cultures, African customs, and see how those can be also integrated within the whole design process. I got to work for him and got to see exactly how that looks within his practice, got to see how exactly they try to include people from different communities with the development of public spaces and also the development of built environments in general. 
Why I enjoyed that experience was because from that I was able to take my ethos that I'm building a little bit more and more, but my architectural viewpoint that I came out of that with was to try and create architectural spaces that allow other people to have autonomy over it. And what that means is they can come into a space and see already how they can make their own interventions, their own changes, and also make it home. This can exist in public space, in private space, and in many kinds of spaces, but we want people to have that kind of ownership of a design intervention even once it's done. The great thing about that, and when I actually got to develop that a little bit more, is that that coincided with my time of starting at the D School. The D School is all about trying to uh, build creative confidence for students and I think I found myself right at home from the moment I started working here because yes, for all of the participants who come in and out of our doors, we want them to have creative confidence, but also for me, anyone who comes into a building or into any kind of space that I would get to, to intervene or create a design for in any way, I want them to be confident to take it on, uh, to take it on make it home and also build it into anything that they like as well. But yeah. That's a little bit about me, and I'm really keen to keep sharing a lot more as we go on. Cool. Thank you. So it's so interesting, you know, we've, I've met everyone on the stage before, but once again, I've learned a few more things. Um, and what stood out for me is this little thread between everyone here is, um, I think George, you said, um, how can you participate in creating? And I think everyone had that little moment. How do I get more people to create, to participate in creating? Um, I think with the students, how do you have a creative confidence to participate? I think that's something very powerful that I've just realized to get to this point is that that's something that must drive you. Right, so our second question, um, we're going to dig a little bit deeper now. So we've got some geographical and chronological context, you know, everybody's little winding it out to get to the stage. Um, you know, that's how our panelists have been guided here today. But I'd like to ask how you think the practice of design thinking has evolved in the past 20 years in your given context. So I know, so for example, similarities or differences. And some people in the industry don't want to maybe go back 20 years, um, but perhaps just think about a pivotal moment that you feel is important to, to bring to our attention. So I think um, we can start with Gendi this time. Yeah, thank you again. Um, I think for me, the it started off as an intellectual puzzle. Um, now that we understand the power of design thinking, how do we democratize design thinking, how do we make it more inclusive, uh, how do we make it uh, more accessible to those that are not in the formal um, spaces, whether it's professional, corporate, uh, or academic. Uh, and for me, the key was the community, local communities, and getting to speak to them in a way that uh, they would also understand the potency of design thinking uh, and the agency that each individual brought to, to bear uh, on the process. Um, and so the harvesting of sayings and proverbs and songs and dance and other forms of expression that are not necessarily um, uh, you know, uh, linguistic in, in nature sometimes or, or, or formal uh, became an important part of, of making design thinking happen. And I think the exercise that this, this school uh, went through in trying to unpack uh, some of the principles of design thinking into visual and, and linguistic um, uh, uh, cues that can be understood by even local communities was a big part. And I'd say the test of the pudding uh, uh, or the, the piloting of that thinking was a project we did uh, with the city and uh, Richard again was, was very much uh, a part of that process where the mayor of this city, uh, uh, um, Patricia DeLille, asked us to look at a solid waste management uh, project uh, in an informal setting in Danone. And immediately the so-called wicked problems that designers have to grapple with came up. And I think that has become more and more the, the normal of, of, of what uh, I believe was a pivotal shift back in 2014 of where design thinking is heading. Thanks. Thank you so much. I remember that project very well. I think it was um, those are still, that project is still going. Um, 
I, I think what I've got there is that I democratised this. That one that will stick with me. Um, how about we go to TF4? Cool. So I think my big observation around how, I guess, design thinking has been a little bit more democratised is also just around like some of the tools that enable people to get into the actual practices of practicing design. So I'd mentioned The Sims as an easy example for me, where a starting point is that there is a game that is there for children to actually play around with their creativity and craft space. Participatory design has been another space where you get to see how that kind of democratization can happen. But I think there's one place that really shifts by year, year by year, and COVID has shown, this, shown us this quite a lot, is going to be all of the tools that we use to try and express a lot of our ideas. So from the moment that it started at the D school, pre-COVID, at the way with it, we kind of had our final projects looked a very specific way. We would do a final presentation with a lot of role play and a lot of props and a lot of um, acting out how something can look. During our COVID time, a lot of tools just evolved gradually. And I think that that really gave a lot of people capacity to express their ideas in ways that they haven't been able to before. And we think of things like Canva as one place where, yes, we use PowerPoint before to show things, but on Canva, people are making apps. People are making uh, full pitch decks, full presentations that really can express their ideas in full. And I think that level of confidence to actually engage with those tools, the barrier to entry is becoming so low that like people can express themselves so much more today than ever before. One other place where I think it happens quite a lot is that people get to work within the social media space to create any kind of content that they want. And very quickly, your brief is, can I make a video to entertain people? and people are extremely confident to actually take that on. And I think the tools of the social media design, sorry, the tools of the social media editing tools and, and stuff like that, like that's really something that expresses the idea that like the tools are enabling people to become more confident to express more and more and more of the ideas. And they evolve so quickly. So just think of the last five years, think of all the tools that you've changed before COVID and right now, and think of how easy things are to do and how easy it is to express the tools, um, your ideas rather today. And yeah, I think that's my big observation. Thanks, dear Paul. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Uh, I don't think, especially post-COVID, we don't always realize how much our learning curve, uh, how big that learning curve was during COVID. Yeah. Um, I think we'll go to Marissa. I think for me, I always kind of have my technical training in the back of my mind. Um, so for me, it's all the things that I was using um, to kind of work in the education space so for me it's like how do we actually create um, i think like mcgain is saying like accessible language making language accessible accessible programs um, or, or ways to express um, your ideas creative, creatively um, and working in more under-resourced communities and working with a, so um, you know, startups or, or social enterprises that don't really know where they wanting to go, or even with um, you know the government and, and participatory um, action or in citizenship. For me, it's before, um, even before when I was trying to explore, the, not everyone had the language or the access or the knowing. Whereas now, when when I mention something, it's kind of already scaffolded on the existing knowledge. Um, so even like uh, open commons or like even like the, the MOOCs um, and the, the access has really improved, I think. I think we still have a long way to go, particularly in, in developing countries um, and, and the global south, but I definitely feel like the, the access the, the language which we still need to kind of work on and making that a little bit more um, accessible. Um, also, the way that we need to continue to co-design and co-create and create other yet-to-be-explored ways of um, allowing opportunities for practice and allowing opportunities for learning. Um, I think there's still a way to go, but I definitely see that um, definitely in the sphere of education, accessible um, resources and then making language a little bit more plain to understand, um, we've come a, a, a way. Okay, thanks Marissa. Um, so lastly, George, do you, do you echo any of what's been shared or, or any differences to what you've heard now? 
um, I would definitely resonate with a lot of what was said about democratization and creative tools and um, language and all that that give us handholds into a creative process where I where I was feeling was like you asked how has it evolved in the last 20 years like from my as I stand in that question like as I since I intersected with it even something design being mindful about the way we move and design prior to the D school I think of the 20 years prior the 20 so 40 years ago 20 years ago now and then 20 years forward is a little bit more of the lens that I find myself sitting in. So if I just like try to do a quick thread in maybe 90 seconds, it would be, when I encountered it, it was a personal process. It was like, be mindful of your creative process. Here's one example, like start with observation and human techniques and then move to defining the problem and then ideation and then prototyping. This may be a way to start with, but make it your own. And wherever you find you need support, adapt it, invent new steps, evolve it. And so that's how I first encountered it. It was a very, um, an introduction to be creative about your own creative process. The D, so then when the D School formed, but that was primarily held in communities that thought of themselves as designers or creatives. So the question is, if you didn't think of yourself as creative, how did you get an access point to recognize that literally everything is designed, but most of the time not that intentionally to be creative? And so the D School came around and recognized that everything was designed and started to make that process, give a vocabulary and say, hey, everything is designed. Even if, if you might be in business or you might be in education, you might be in law or you might be in government, here's a way of working that you can then be creative about designing businesses or designing policies or designing healthcare systems. And so what was really magical at that time is the D School then invited, gave a language, it became from a personal process to a shared vocabulary about how we create things together that require diverse perspectives. So that was really, became a very flourishing environment and we can feel what that's like here. Um, it was exciting for me then in terms of evolution to start to see how it unlocked the creative agency in everyone, regardless of their discipline or who they thought they were. And then how it can be pointed and mixed with many other methodologies. So like when, in a way, design thinking is nothing on its own. It has to be design thinking meets education. And then as that methodology applies to the domain of education, it has to reinvent itself. Like design thinking with the environment, it has to reinvent itself. So it was start to, be blended with the other practices and, and that and then starting to see that spread globally was really exciting uh, and then you see things into like ecosystem scale like Singapore using design thinking to think about designing creative economies so that starts to like really spark our imagination about what's the scope and potential of what we can dare to reimagine and um, the unexpected thing, maybe I'll just end with these last two, the unexpected thing for me as I've traveled is when the moment we've externalized the creative process and come up with a codification of it, the opportunities that unlocks all those things. The risk I found is people see it and go, well, that's the way to work. And then they sever their own instinct. They stop listening to their own creative instinct. And they try to enact an external process. And if a company gets a hold of it and says, this is the way we work, then you can be formulaic about it, but you've killed something. And so I know and that then may be a surprise, and I would ask that question, what about humanity takes something that has been codified and think that's the truth, and then we stop paying attention to what it's pointed to, and this is some creative essence. We do that in everything, religion, companies, so it happened with design as well. So I, I just put that up as a caution and the invitation going forward is it was always meant to be a personal invitation like if these handholds give you a doorway to practice and discover something yourself please use them and then don't forget though the final question that is what's your most natural way of moving invent your own creative technologies and unlock discover what your interior architecture is that's unique to you, and find ways to animate that with others who are very dis different than you. And then I think that might be the unlock for the next 20 years. Okay. 
pictures of stuff in. Go do that. <laughs> So, thank you very much. Um, so that was just about the last 20 years or just the evolution of design thinking as experienced by our panelists. But now we'll open up to, to the audience. Um, I feel like we can have this conversation all, all the time, so I'll invite you in. Um, any questions, comments, um, we'll, we'll invite those questions. Good evening, uh, colleagues. I'm Johnny Fries from the Education Department. Um, thank you, panelists. It's very refreshing what we hear. I just want to bring you in onto something that I am going to say, that I'm not allowed or supposed to say it, but I am going to say it now because I've signed an NDA. <laughs> to hell with the NDA, this is what's going to happen. The coding and robotics curriculum that's going to be released is for grade R to grade 9 in the general education and training band. At the heart of that curriculum, that is for every single school, every single classroom in this country. There are two things at the heart of that curriculum. One is computational thinking, and the other is design thinking. <laughs> You're the first to know about this. <laughs> um, so that opens up an entire generation of learners to express themselves creatively to solve problems. The flavor of the, of the design thinking is more in the engineering side, because it's coding and robotics. The product that they end up will be a robot, a robot, either a real or a virtual robot, and but it's all as a result of the process of design thinking. So just a comment I wanted to make. Don't tell anyone, please. <laughs> Thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Um, it's also lovely to see a fellow Kenyan on the panel. <laughs> My name is Liz Mwangi. I am here a student here at UCT. I, as you were speaking, all of you, I kept on going back to the last line, which is opening up the practice. And I kind of saw like a golden theme of being in a university space where, you know, the ideal is incubated and people come here, they learn this language. Hopefully they don't codify it and go take it out there. Um, and I was thinking a lot about that is, how do we then make sure that this university space doesn't only become the space that is the only space that's growing that, and then it's diffused out there? How do we contextualize it? How do we make it more accessible to, I don't know, like communities that aren't able to access university education? Um, I know in Kenya, human center design is just coming up recently. It's not as maybe taken up as here in South Africa or other countries or in the USA. So yeah, I'm curious about that and I'm curious specifically about that line. How do you open up that practice and not codify it in the process? Now, still translating from Hakuna Matata to what, um, <laughs> what, what, what Liz has just shared. Um, yes, indeed, and uh, IDEO.org uh, opened up its uh, global office in Nairobi. Uh, and that has been a big, uh, even McKinsey and others have offices in Nairobi that really are pushing design thinking. Um, I think the way to keep it from getting codified, um, from my background, the good book says that the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. Um, how we keep um, things alive and not just in, in, in books, not just in principles that are easy to recall, but how to keep them uh, as living. And I think the way in which this is done is to really genuinely uh, relinquish the power that comes with uh, being a facilitator in design thinking and hand that power back to the community where it belongs anyway. 
Uh, it's a difficult process for a designer, but it's the only logical conclusion if you want a process that is truly uh, participatory. And I dare say it has to move beyond a mere empowerment to emancipatory um, outcomes, where the community itself decides thanks, but no thanks. This is where we part ways. Uh, we, it was nice knowing you. Or they say, we like what you said, now come back and we do something else. Uh, so that can only happen if you truly, as an individual, uh, allow yourself to be a vessel so that you're humble enough to admit that you are part of the solution, not the solution, and to also allow them to use an asset-based approach where they identify what they already have and that becomes the basis of that conversation. That, that's how we did the project with the solid waste management. The community actually came up with the ideas and the role of the designer was merely to facilitate uh, and act almost as an interpreter of what the community needed and what the government's aspirations were, and in this case, the local government, and ultimately to allow yourselves to be sent off uh, with a smile and a wave. And that was our reward for being part of that process. Thank you. Can I add something to that? Yeah. Uh, so one other practical way that we've got to see that happen here at the D School. When I arrived here the first time, when we were still at the waterfront, I used to see them just packing around this big red suitcase. And I'd always wondered, what is this red suitcase? So week after week, this red suitcase just keeps popping up in somebody else's hand, and I still can't figure it out, like what's it for, until the day that, we're, that I'm meant to be part of the team that's taking the red suitcase around. So this red suitcase for us is a, a suitcase filled with design thinking tools, or rather, tools that we can use for design thinking. For us, when you're walking around with that and taking it across the country, that's how we were able to spread what we think the practice of design thinking is and what we think it can do. What we're hoping to do with that red suitcase once we arrive, yes, we're going to facilitate a design thinking workshop, but ultimately we want somebody else to feel ownership of their own uh, red suitcase. So come see what we're showing you in this red suitcase, learn the practice that we're sharing, see if it is something for you, but the one thing that we want you to do is to take ownership of these tools as well and see how you can apply them at some, at some point. So if you want to do it in your own facilitation practice, cool get a red suitcase, but it doesn't have to be the same one. Maybe you can come with your Louis Vuitton suitcase, maybe you can come with your red backpack. But it's really that bootstrap mentality of like, you can take these tools and bring them into any other place or into your own community and be ready to actually practice it and take it on as your own that we want people to take on. So one thing that we also speak about is trying to create this multiplier effect and also having like these champions of design thinking who actually want to spread it out see its use case within the context that they're operating in, but also know that the, there's an ultimate benefit that the people that they're working with will also be able to get from it. So yeah, I think the red suitcase, red backpack, red fanny pack, I'm hoping that like many people will actually get to like create their own and also take ownership of that because that's one practical way that we've enjoyed actually spreading the design thinking thing. But, yeah, thank you. We'll take one last question. Hi, good evening. My name is Unati Dendara. I am a career guidance counselor as well as a life coach. Um, speak to me like I am a grade 10 pupil who lives in Guguletu or lives in Bondiwo. And I have no idea about the D school, but I love everything that is creative and design. I don't know how I'm gonna get to UCT, I don't have the funds, I have nothing, but if I were to be put into this building, my head would explode. Speak to me about the journey. How do, is there a way of getting to me, reaching me at my high school? Do you have programs that work with schools so that these, these young kids can actually be exposed to design? And also, um, how do they run, where do they run? How do kids have, have access to that? Thank you very much. Thank you, Unati. Thank you for the work that you do and the great question. We do actually have certain programs and projects running. Um, and as Tiejo mentioned, um, not necessarily only through D-School as our multiplier effect. And one of our um, project partners and contributors, Oribi, is here. They do Girls in Business. Um, and that is actually a program running in the townships with young girls. 
um, that, that don't have access um, to what we would necessarily see here in the building. Even data is an issue, even getting there safely um, is an issue. So as Tiago mentioned, our kind of multiply effect is equipping our contributors, project partners, um, strategic partnerships to go out and be their own kind of multiplier within within the sector, whether it's education, um, whether it's cooperative governance within government, um, and even in corporates that are maybe um, you know more socially conscious corporates wanting to make an effect change. So we do have strategic partnerships that that allow for those opportunities. We also have within the D school one of our new kind of strategic focuses. Um, has been um, in partnership also with Siemens Stuften as well as um, D School Africa looking at a schools program where we actually work with the, the, the Department of Education, um, WCED, working with uh, yeah, um, school management teams to STEM educators to um, after school programs where they are running programs, they are um, you know, transferring knowledge, working with, with, with the curriculum. And we also looking at how do we capacitate them to be facilitators, um, not only of design-led um, thinking or design-led mindsets, but um, in kind of human-centered design and going for the agency for communities to co-create their own solutions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm just gonna move into facilitator mode quickly. Um, so the, the, the schools project is really interesting. If, if you want to think about complex times, um, the legacy that we have in the schools, um, trying to address that, and the, just the various scales and resources that we have across different schools, uh, that, is a comp that is complex times. And trying to bring design thinking into that has been uh, quite a challenge, but it's it's a challenge that we're up for, um, and we are actively trying to address it. Um, but it's uh, it, it, we we basically pausing at the moment and just trying to regroup and see where we have to go next. But it's definitely on the cards. Okay, so back to the questions. Um, so thank you very much for for participation. Um, we're going to move slightly more thinking forward now. Um, well, first a little bit back again, but in order to look forward. So how, so we thought about the evolution of design thinking, but maybe thinking a little bit more deeply, how do the existing design thinking practices, and I think you, you started to touch on that really about the codification and just like sticking to that. Um, so how do existing design thinking practices enable or hinder the impact of the practice in fast changing times. So, anybody can start with that. Um, who would like to go first? <laughs> yeah, George, you touched on it already. How do design thinking practices enable or hinder moving in fast moving times? Um, that's a, a, can I answer that slowly? <laughs> okay, um, I think one of the things that's not necessarily obvious when we try to tackle problems is we all feel the urgency of the things that need to be addressed, and the things that aren't working, and so we already feel behind, is one. And the second is things seem to be speeding up, so it feels like we need to move faster. And I would say that's very natural to feel that. It's just gonna feel more and more that way. The third thing is often the strategies we've used in the past are, aren't always shifting things the way they need to. And, and they sometimes make it worse. So like feeling behind, rushing and going faster and working the ways we that have served us in the past aren't working anymore. I would say I find this is increasingly a global feeling. Is I hear it everywhere, in every environment, whether you're in the financial services industry in New York, whether you're in education in the U.S., whether you're working on, um, in Africa, you guys can speak to that a little bit more, but I would say this is increasingly a human situation, is where I would almost 
feel like we're at not a 10 year change cycle or 20, we're talking, that it's an epochal change, the kind of place we are in humanity, which is both terrifying and thrilling because it requires a, a creative orientation. We don't get to know what's coming. If we don't participate, we don't get to continue to re-meet the moment and design our way forward. So it's, it's calling all of us, not just in this building, but globally, to start to learn how to move in new ways. And so then, how do we meet those things? Is what's interesting is the mind doesn't like being in an environment that doesn't know the answer and doesn't know the way forward and doesn't know it's going to be safe. Because the, and the, the mind is not going to show us the way forward. It's a great capacity, but it needs to be like in the back of the bus, uh, evaluating things. The thing that's going to lead is a much deeper place. And our intuition and the part of our voices that don't have an explanation do give us clues of ways to move. So it's about inviting us into, and this is what design thinking ultimately was originally for, was thinking, a, a friend of mine said, thinking is one of the worst ways of thinking. <laughs> because it's only a small part of our capacity. We have all these other capacities, our gut intelligence, our heart capacities, our intuitive sense, our emotional intelligence, our f embodied and physical intelligence. We know this. and. Um, the other AI, ancestral intelligence, like versions of us a long time ago knew some of this stuff. So design thinking was meant to awaken these other capacities in us. And, um, and they thrive in the unknown. And creativity is the toolkit towards moving towards unknown outcomes. If you knew the outcome, it's not a creative act. So I would say, um, it's a personal work, excuse me, personal work to navigate that internal situation of like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I can sense what's next. And to be intentional about that, that's what design thinking is, is to be intentional about taking one next step and learning from it, taking another step and learning from it. And maybe I'll end by saying, um, often the, most of the failures in industry weren't because we didn't have enough ideas and weren't creative, it's that we solved the wrong problem. So a lot of design thinking by, by, so that's a lot of wasted effort as we put all our energies in the wrong place. And design thinking practice opens the question about what is the right questions and what are the right problems and what's underneath that we can't see, what's systemic that, and invites us into surfacing those so at least we put our creative energies in the places that matter. So I would say trusting your deeper intuition, animating that with an intentional process and questioning the question and everything you're doing that's in the heart of design thinking. It may be lost if you're just trying to run a process, but that's the invitation um, going forward. Thanks, George. I knew you could do us uh, good there. Um, I just want to agree uh, with uh, George's point because I think the world we are in is obsessed with uh, speed, um, scale, and sophistication. This is what we are forced to do in our day-to-day -day living. When you have a good idea, someone wants to, to just accelerate it to market or whatever the idea is. Um, yet, the biggest concern for this century, in my view, uh, and it's a really humble opinion, is, is the issue of sustainability. Um, so now that we can speed up, uh, scale up, and create very sophisticated systems, how do we ensure the sustainability of these uh, uh, systems or solutions, uh, whatever it is we're coming up with? And uh, there's a beautiful uh, proverb that says that if, if you run alone, you run fast, uh, but if we run together, we run far. And I, I think therein lies the, the, the clue to how we can actually get the sustainability bit sorted. If we can deepen our empathy sufficiently to connect with other people we need to run or to move or to advance together with, uh, then the issue of sustainability is more or less guaranteed. Some of these issues are wicked problems, if I can add. Um, and another proverb comes to mind, that if you don't want to get eaten by a crocodile, uh, cross the river in a crowd. So how, how do we uh, win each other over uh, we know there is a present danger and there are wicked problems ahead, but not moving forward is not a solution, it's not an option. Uh, how do we uh, get the courage to move forward uh, and 
and, and vanquish what is before us, but also get to the other side of this river and uh, get to the solutions we so seek. Um, so I think with the differing context of the 3D schools, like one quick observation that I have around the conditions for which people get the most confidence to actually make their own interventions, they kind of vary within our three contexts. So in Stanford, heart of Silicon Valley, there's a lot of investors around there. And I think the motivation for the youth or whoever's getting into this design space to like make an intervention is that I know that I can get a big investor to fund it. I don't really have too much risk. I can still do this while at uni and I'm quite excited to do it then, but I can drop out and actually get rich. That's a nice motivation. But that's one condition that can motivate people to make any kind of design intervention within Stanford context. Uh, within the German D school in Potsdam, uh, they have a far bigger social safety net around just schooling and like how schooling is funded. So you can spend a little bit more time in uni, you can explore a little bit more around like any ideas that you want, but those conditions over there means that you don't have to rush through school, but you can try and like, you know, while you're there, try and create like new problems or new solutions to existing problems. The spaces like the D school there will also give you more time to do that, but like that's one condition that like exists over there. So here in South Africa, one condition for us is that we kind of come into university knowing that we need to rush through and finish in record time. It is not the most sustainable to for you financially sustainable anyways for you to stay in university, spend extra years and try and actually like, I don't know, explore your interests creatively. So I think the timing of an intervention such as the D school is quite good here because now in those three or four years, we're trying to say, do this while you're studying, see what kind of things you can create while you're here, and we want to see if you can actually continue to do this once you're done. But as soon as you walk in here, you have the conditions to actually practice this a little bit more, and you have the conditions to try and like make your ideas come alive. So I'd like to add to the question of sustainability and how we can sustain that desire, because it's very easy to get the, that desire to create interventions when you're walking in the room, when you're here in the space. But I guess the question again of like, how can we get people to walk out with those red suitcases and actually go out there and continue to make interventions in their own capacity is something we continue to try to answer. Do we have that answer yet? Not 100%, but I think we are making small strides to get there bit by bit. But yeah. I think for me, hearing everyone's reflection on that question, um, what stands out for me is again around the, the, the codifying, and the, yeah, giving it code and letting it sit there. And like we always speak about the three Ps, people, pra people place and process. Um, and sometimes we get stuck there. And even like in the, the, the word itself, design thinking, and we get stuck, stuck in the thinking and we don't do the doing, or we get stuck in the doing and we don't get to the being. Um, so how do we acknowledge the thinking, the doing, and the being, and how do we integrate that into our practice? And then how do we open up that practice um, within the complexities that we live or work or solve in? Um, and then I think as um, everyone has mentioned, moving from the individualistic aspect to the sheet and the collective and bringing it back to Ubuntu and the why and the how we solve. So, Thank you so much. Um, so we've got a little bit of time for questions on, on this one. Questions, comments, living? Uh, hi everyone, I'm Lavinia. Uh, thank you for your uh, entertaining perspectives. Um, I hear the word sustainability a lot and I think it means different things to different people. Um, I'm just wondering how, if you say we're reframing design in complex times, it's, it's as though we are not... So we're working in complexity but we're not addressing complexity, right? Uh, I think I'm just wondering about the potential of design thinking to actually tackle some of these wicked issues that we face. And I mean, we are trying out something, but 
it's, it's extremely difficult, uh, but I'm just wondering how you actually reframe it, whether you reframe the process, whether you reframe how you do it, who sits at the table, how do we actually reframe it so that, you know, I hear a lot of like, oh, we're going to, I mean, not as, as, as dramatic as changing the world, but uh, changing things and addressing things, but I'm struggling to see how we move. I mean, I can see how we move from mindset to change, but, but does design thinking actually have a, have a place in, in solving actual wicked issues? Uh, yeah, just thinking about how, how you might reframe it. I think I would humbly say that we don't know everything about design thinking and we don't know every way that design thinking is practiced right now. One way that I think is a good way for us to start is to start to acknowledge all of the narratives around how it is being practiced today from all the different parties who are practicing it in different places and in all their different capacities. So trying to get those narratives spread out a little bit further into the world I think is a good starting point because we get to understand how they're doing things and we get to understand how other people are actually practicing this exact same thing. I think within the university space we usually have to validate ways of thinking and ways of working around what some kind of a research process and I don't think and I think that with design thinking we have the opportunity to acknowledge other ways of working without having to go solely into like that research space as a start. A lot of the work that we do can be driven by narrative, can be driven by social exchange, and can be driven by a lot more of alternative ways of working. But I think recognizing those stories and recognizing those ways of working is a starting point. But I do believe they exist. I do believe that there are many people taking on these challenges in the capacity of design thinkers, but maybe with a different title though. And yeah, I'll post that. I just wanted to check if anybody else wanted to add to that question, yeah. um, and then we'll go to that. Was it Lavinia? Is that right? I appreciate the question. Um, and the response, um, maybe I'll just offer two things and there's not an answer, but it's just what's present. One is I'm finding an intersection between design practices and those who study complex systems. Like when you put them together, you start to then have hybrid tools and techniques. Um, and that's exciting and we need that. The other, the other thing that's present for me is I've had a deep fascination around emergent systems, which is another language for complex systems. Like you see this in like the way colonies of ants work and schools of fish work. And they defy our rational mind's understanding about the way systems work because our rational mind thinks of systems in hierarchical ways. Information flows from top to bottom and back up. We can lead towards predictable outcomes. That's how we've structured almost all of our institutions that we inhabit now, whether the design of school systems and businesses and corporate structures, uh, government systems. And what's, what's been happening in the last three decades, I read this book called Out of Control by Kevin Kelly like a long time ago, and he was like, the things we build are approaching biologic complexity. Biologic systems run on different rules than industrial systems. And until we start to learn how what it's like to be a part of that and work with those types of dynamics, we will struggle. And the book is called Out of Control for a reason, because you don't feel in control, you don't get to control those types of systems, they're far more so, and the things we're putting in the world now, like our global networks and our communication networks and the way we do drug discovery and um, artificial intelligence, these things have been growing in more biologic ways. And the really interesting opportunity is to cultivate that way of relating to systems. And if we just keep trying to hammer these problems, wicked problems with industrial approaches, we will continue to be confused We'll continue to do like stopgap solutions. We'll never get underneath to the root causes and we'll continue to struggle. And the opportunity is to sort of see them more like living systems and to be a part of that, not separate from it. And the thing that I find which is really fascinating, maybe I'll end here, is these emergent systems run on relatively simple rules at the local level. 
they they are simple at, at, the, at, at the local level, but the the result at the global level are unpredictable. The opportunity I think is we've been a lot of the systemic issues I think that we face globally is because we've been severed as participants from our creative agency, and then we struggle against a system that doesn't allow us to show up fully, and then we get these ripples in power and in capital and in solutions and awareness of what the actual problems are. And so we're severed from that. And I think part of the shift will be to restore our sense of creative agency at all scales, at human scale, and team and family scales, at group scales, at community scales and collective scales. It will invite a much more natural way of moving. It's just not the one that we've been educated in necessarily. And so I think this is such an important time to find how do we unlock that creative agency and then build systems to allow us to move in our most natural way. We're currently in systems that don't allow that. I think that's one of the root causes. Okay, thank you so much. I think we'll just take that last question back there. Hello, my name is Jody. Um, thanks for your chat today. Um, I was just curious to know, when you guys find yourself in design spaces, um, since design thinking has taken on this approach where we are democratizing and making it accessible to everyone in business spaces, in all these different spaces, do you find that um, when you go into spaces where there are designers that you are stepping on toes, or do you feel, or are, are there times when those tensions arise where people are like, but is this even design? Like, do you know what you are speaking about? Um, because, I mean, there are obviously people who have gone through the process of studying a design discipline, and then now design thinking is accessible to everyone, and everyone becomes an expert in their own specific field. Um, I wanted to know what your take was on that. <laughs> okay, who wants to take this one? Jeffo? I like that question a lot. <laughs> um, so I think the one challenge that I've also had when looking at like architecture as a design practice, now as a designer, is that we almost kind of limit the scope to which you think you can practice. Just because I studied how to make buildings, I'm not going to try and make any kind of interventions that aren't a building. And I think that's almost irresponsible because Going, the <laughs> making a building is expensive, and that shouldn't be always the answer for any kind of problem. So now I have this design capacity to address human problems, but I'm going to say no, I won't use it because I can't make anything that's not a building. So I almost feel irresponsible as an architect to not explore any other design practice where, yes, I can learn like a few, a little bit more about like how to engage with it further, but I'm going to say no, I can't actually engage with it because it's not going to be a building. That feels irresponsible. So I think the design capacity that we do build as designers, just in general, professionally trained designers, is to work with people and to work on real existing problems and try to address them. So if we had to use that same thinking for designers, I want to say that using it again for like everybody else in the world is really just to say, stick to what you know and don't explore further. And that can be a very big limitation and a loss of opportunity of how much we can explore. I think that many people across disciplines and across uh, formal design or formal study backgrounds, excuse me, they're able to actually engage with other practices and other spaces as well. And if design thinking might be the starting point for that, where they're saying, hey, I can get into this space and I can also try and understand a little bit more about that actual practice, then they can start to explore other, other spaces as well, I feel. Um, but I think it's a nice entry point for you to try and understand other fields and other disciplines. And if there is a point where you need to hand it over to other professional designers, be ready to do that. You do have a limitation in some of your capacity, but don't let it stop you from starting an explorative process though. Yeah, I think for me also, um, both working within kind of the school setting, the school Africa setting, where we are co-creating, we are scoping with other faculties, other universities, other kind of project partners and organizations, both you know corporate and government. Um, you do kind of get those roadblocks and those difficult conversations. And I think there is value in having those conversations and um, kind of setting the terms of, is it a, is it, is it a partnership? 
is the AMOU, SLA, like um, figuring out what needs to happen, um, but also realizing, okay, we've reached the end of our, our, um, our, our project life cycle and maybe something doesn't get implemented and for that also to be okay. Um, and hoping that maybe just the, the practice or the praxis or the principles um, get infused in in the ways of working when working collaboratively and that it's not necessarily just the implementation of a project or a solution. Um, and I think, like Tiago mentioned, that could be just the start of a conversation and maybe that conversation is like, oh, you don't think like us, you don't work like us, you, you, you don't look like us. Um, and having that kind of shared experience around the table um, that maybe you bring that as a value and as an asset to the, the co-design conversation. Um, similar to when we having our foundations program, we intentionally mixing the faculties and the lived experience and um, that is what makes for real kind of multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary um, collaborative solution finding. Thanks Marissa. Um, I think I think that question could probably go on for a while with our experiences, but um, thanks for the question. So we have a final question, and that question is, what are some of the considerations that need to be taken into account to amplify a more authentic African narrative within the field, example in design thinking education, in research and practice? And just given the amount of time, I think I'll just, okay, I want, I'd like you to start us off on, on this and then we can open up to the floor because I think this is, we're generating some, some questions. Um, yeah, so if you could just, just start us off on that and then we'll go to the, to the floor. Yeah, well, thanks. Um, I think one, one uh, phenomenon that I've observed is that we don't often have pure solutions. We have pure ideals, but the solutions uh, that come through the process because of the wickedness of the process end up being um, something that may not be what you as a designer may intend, but as long as the community has owned that process, has owned that co-creative uh, solution, then you, you're onto something. Uh, there is a slide, and maybe Liza, if you share that, I, I'd be happy. Uh, a slide on uh, my principle of hybridity. Uh, did she hear me? Okay. Liza? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, the reason I like to use this particular slide is that I think the, the way design thinking works is that we use what already exists. We use lo-fi prototyping. We do our best to fail uh, early, often but there's no pure solution in the real sense because the solution is co-created by those that are present using the resources that they have. And um, the slide will come on and I'll have finished speaking by then, but I'd just like to discuss this with you after the fact because I think uh, what I have to say may go way beyond this conversation because it's being co-created as well. This is not a final thought. It is where I'm at on this journey of co-creation and um, I think that should be the way in which we take this. So don't get too precious around the solutions that you come up with as a, as a design thinking practitioner. Don't get too precious. Instead, pray that the team, the community, uh, or whoever is uh, on the receiving end owns the process enough to want to carry on even if you step aside. And I think for me that would be the way I'd go with this process. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think while we wait, we can come back to the slide, but I think I want to go to the floor before we end for the evening. So, we had a question at the back now. Green hat and then black hat. Uh, thank, uh, <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. Um, I just wanted to assist my uh, colleague here who spoke about um, how to make it more accessible. I think um, nothing can be done in isolation. And I think government has got a big role in terms to play in terms of implementation. Like I speak about this from a climate change perspective. Uh, climate change was, was predicted 
like some of the, the the effects that we're experiencing now, like the hot weather changing conditions and ETC, this was predicted like in 1994, 1998 white papers, that we should transition from renew, um, coal to renewable sources of energy. And now we're sort of facing the backlash of that. And I feel that government has um, unions, right? So there are four, uh, there are four major unions that we can use, and I think um, I, I did hear somebody speak about the reformation of the education curriculum. I think it's the owners of people who have the power, like our panelists who are sitting in front, who um, understand how design thinking works, um, to communicate and actually be more proactive than reactive, in order for them to say, "Hey, listen, this is this is something we discovered, and it would benefit." Uh, the country as a whole, and um, it, this can be channeled through unions, it can be channeled through various channels, but I think the major thing is that nothing can be implemented without the role of government, and that's one thing we need to, to, to put into consideration in terms of the implementation of the reformation of all education curriculum to suit this and the needs that these kids definitely have. That was just my add-on to <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, sorry, for around the question. Hi, um, I'll try and make this quick. Um, so, just to touch on to what you mentioned earlier on, um, design is meant to make things a lot easier for the people around, and I think once a successful design has been implemented, it, becomes a process in the system, and obviously we, we're coming across with system-based thinking where people are not feeling agency to have to act. You know, almost like how, if you look at how government started, government is supposed to be the people. Now people are, now the people are waiting back and say the government should do something, just backing up on that. So, um, but design thinking is actually supposed to push for the individual right to have agency in making that change within themselves my question is i may not phrase it the best way best way but how do you see design thinking core living with system-based thinking yeah who would like to take that one okay george thanks well, it's, um, so how does design thinking work with system-based thinking? And I, 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 I can see that at, at a scale dimension and also a discipline dimension and many other things. So a scale dimension, often the problems that we face is because we solve for the individual level but not at the system level. Or we solve at the system level but not at the human level. And, and, and we have great sciences and, and disciplines in each of those but they've stayed separate for the most part. So one, one place to start is to sort of bring those worlds together and to start to ask the, the same questions at an individual level and what's the system implications and that the system questions with the individual implications and start to put those in a constructive tension. And so I find these schools at least are often safe places to bring different kinds of thinkers together who might not otherwise sit at the same, same table. Hopefully that should happen everywhere. Um, so that's one, is we have to start to weave the things that we know about systems and about humans together. The second, um, um, I, I would, you can blend these methodologies. So we, we can take design thinking and ask, like, we have empathy for the human, do we have empathy for the system, like systempathy? We have ways of prototyping for the human experience, do we have ways of prototyping at the system level? Um, I think those can sometimes be an unlock. And maybe the third thing, um, and these are just starting points, these are not easy answers. Again, I, I think I mentioned my interest in living systems. The really curious things about living systems is that they have these fractal patterns. You guys heard that word, fractal patterns? You see this in a nautilus shell, or just look at a tree. A tr what is a tree? It's just the same pattern over again, like branching and branching. So fractal means you have the same pattern at all scales. We don't design our industrial systems that way. So we have we run into issues of scale. Things that work at one scale don't work at another. Nature doesn't have that problem. 
the same patterns work at all scales. So we have not been taught to look for the fractal patterns of things. That was one of my personal design philosophies that I was attempting to experiment with in the early days of the D school. I was, I was asking the question, can I create the design school to be an emergent system, a living system? And I was looking for those patterns. And then you don't have the same scale challenges. What works at the team level also works at the organization level. What works at the organization works at the human level. So I think we're at the very beginnings of a whole new season where we get to question everything about the systems we put in place and the philosophy of those systems. And if, if we're not animated and enlivened here, it's not going to work at the collective level. Um, and so I would just point to those as maybe on ramps for that discussion. It's a very complex problem, but a really exciting one. Okay, thank you so much. We are starting to eat into snack time. Um, but I suggest, <laughs> I suggest you target the person that you want to speak to after this and go hand them a glass of something um, and then ask your question directly. Um, before we end off, I just want to ask McGendy to <laughs> explain the slide because everyone's what is going on there uh, okay thanks i'd like you to look at this uh, image as a design thinking process uh, typically we have five uh, stages or six depending on which model you use and the first one is empathize can you empathize with the driver of this vehicle do you understand what his challenges are and what he's trying to achieve in this harsh environment. Uh, this is in Botswana in the Kalahari Desert. Um, secondly, are you able to define the problem after you've empathized sufficiently with this person? Can you define the problem that he has? I think the problem is straightforward, is sustainable rural transport, okay? So the next stage is to ideate. What does he have that he can start using to imagine a solution? In his case, he has three donkeys. Uh, and he's found this old vehicle that had been abandoned. Uh, then the next stage is to prototype. I think he's testing the prototype, which is the fifth stage, and ultimately implement the solution and go through all kinds of iterations. So what, why I use this uh, particular uh, slide as a metaphor for the design thinking process is often the solution you have in mind is not the one that your end user has but it will work for them if they own it. And this is why this particular slide speaks uh, to the design thinking process for me. This is what I personally, is my quest at present, is to take design thinking to community level, to the point where someone like this man gets it, and he actually uses it uh, to improve the quality of his life. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mdmd. I, I, we, we have to start closing off now, um, but I think that's a really good place to stop because um, understanding our communities um, and having them own the process is something I think that we have to learn as practitioners in order to open up the practice. It's how do we let go of how we do things in a studio or, you know, and even with our, our read bags, is, is that a barrier, having the read bags and the UCT tags and things like that? So I think we really need to reflect and think about that, about how, how we give communities agency, invite them in, how do we get them to invite us in, maybe it's a bit of trust that has to be built up, and having all of that built into our five to six stages. So maybe we need to think, we need to add or remove stages. Um, I had a long list of really interesting insights. I'm not going to go through all of them, but actually, you know, there was just some words, some my word bubble about um, speed, sophistication, and how we drop that for sustainability. Ancestral intelligence, the new AI, um, making accessible language, making accessible programs. Um, how do we have participatory design 
how COVID just taught us all a lesson. Um, sorry. Maybe we, do we do we need to think forward five years, ten years? Do we have to look back twenty years? Do we have to look back even further? Right? Maybe we're not looking back further enough. We, we haven't learned from a history now. Um, I think um, we've had very good discussions. We all have to reflect a lot. I think the next step is how we're going to change our practice. What do we actually have to do to enact all of these wonderful ideals? Um, it's like we know it, you know, it's the, the doing. So, um, please stay. We're going to have lots of snacks and uh, refreshments. The panelists will still be around for you to talk. Um, but the one thing that I still need from this audience um, because we need to practice what we preach. This is our first prototype of a design dialogue, and we still have three more versions for the year. So we need to ask our users, what do you want from us, right? So um, I think we'll probably get a feedback survey, and what we need from you is, what do you, what do you want to talk about? What do you know? Um, when we have the next set of panelists up here, um, who do you want them to be? and what questions do you want to ask them um, and what, what format would you like this to be. So not sure when that will be, um, but please let us know what you expect from the next design dialogue. Okay, thank you very much to all the panelists. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs>